and uh, welcome to this week's edition of Behind Headlines. Uh, in this programme we'll be marking the first anniversary uh, since the Russians invaded Ukraine and we'll be asking how has this war changed the world. We'll also be uh, looking back at the f this coming Friday, which is uh, the 24th of February 2022, when over 160,000 Russian troops invaded the Ukraine and shocked the world. And we'll be saying how this war could possibly escalate uh, now that the Chinese are looking to possibly resupply Putin's devastated army in the Ukraine. Um, Reagan, I know that we've touched upon mm. the Ukraine war on, on, on a number of programmes on Behind the Headlines. Uh, we, we did one recently at the beginning of the month, but this is the kind of biggest news story of 2022. Yeah. It's also the biggest news story this year. It has a huge geostrategic ramifications. And, and of course, this war has uh, has actually changed has actually changed the world well we were talking about this impending war um, from 2021 april 2021 i believe was the first program that we did looking at um, whether or not such a war was imminent uh, acknowledging that there were rumblings of it that already the conflict that has been in existence since 2014 seemed to be ramping up but looking at a, a, a greater invasion with munitions and uh, supplies uh, increasing Russia continued to be in denial I believe we did three total programs before the start I even shared some of those programs with um, people or talk, talked about and they were like, no 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 Russia will never invade Ukraine it's uh, there's nothing as it did happen in 2014 that they've already taken a good chunk of land uh, in Crimea. Um, so it, this is just in many ways for Ukrainians, they view it as, oh, you guys are finally catching up. We've been in this conflict for a little while now. Um, but uh, this past year from uh, 2022, the biggest news story, uh, very, very evidently, also very big is just the reality of how Ukraine has met the challenge. I think people were going back, rewinding to 2014 when the government was in shambles, when uh, their president then fled and th th there was just absolute chaos, which is what then gave way to Russia invading um, Crimea and taking it for protection of Russian uh, citizens and Russian interests. Okay. At, at the time, maybe some people could have sympathized and thought, well, Ukraine's a total chaos. And so R Russia has its mark here and it has some interest here. It believes these people want to be part of Russia. You, you, you could have potentially made a case or kind of r rationalized it in some way. Um, but then democratic elections held. Zelensky is appointed. People made a bit of a joke of it because Zelensky is a comedian by trade and a TV uh, actor, presenter, performer uh, over the years in his career. And so they thought this, this guy's not going to be cut out for it. Uh, there was rampant speculation that he would flee and that Russia would just essentially have a clear shot. Uh, and Biden in the first week of the war offered him safe passage. Yeah. Um, just imagine what the Ukraine would look like now if, if uh, Zelensky had fled Ukraine, um, there was no yeah. way that, uh, that Ukraine would have st stood that Russian advance. But I think we need to put mm. things in context as well. I mean, uh, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine is the biggest invasion in, on a sovereign European state that we've seen since the Second World War. Yeah. It also has created the largest refugee crisis that Europe has seen um, since the uh, Second World War. Uh, it's also the closest that we are now in, in a potential nuclear conflict since the Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. of 1962. Um, but not only that, has created uh, uh, gas shortages, has created an energy crisis, but it has also affected world food prices, uh, prices mm -hmm. uh, and uh, certainly the prospect of sending many uh, Middle Eastern nations together with African nations um, into, into starvation with food shortages because Ukraine and also Russia are the kind of breadbaskets of, yeah. of Europe. 
of the Middle East and also the world as well. It's fascinating. I remember, again, throughout this whole process leading up to the initial invasion, a lot of people were saying, well, what would Putin want in Ukraine anyway? And they were viewing Ukraine as if it's this small country. Various armchair commentators, not very familiar with Ukraine as a place or its history, not very familiar with its significance or scale, um, thinking, oh, well, what resources are there? Well, actually a lot. You're exactly right. Breadbasket of Europe, essentially, and all also, um, the war, as you, you rightly uh, indicated, has caused shortages um, in the developing world as well, in various African nations that um, are, as a result of this conflict, being driven to uh, the, the brink of ruin to some degree in, uh, due to the low access of grains. Um, and and oils as well. Also oils, sunflower oil. It's the biggest, I believe, the biggest, maybe the second yes, biggest yeah. producer of uh, sunflower oil. So that's why you, you, you've seen it in your story supermarkets. Simon, I, I go to um, the local Sainsbury's and in the past I used to be able to get anything off the shelf that was there at that place. Uh, now sometimes I have to go to one or two other shops in order to find what I'm looking for because very often the, uh, the, the stock is so low. Yeah, and also I've been uh, reading uh, recently in the uh, National Review, the uh, conservative online publication in the United States, that um, one of their military experts is is talking about how uh, Putin, instead of de-escalating this conflict, could escalate the conflict mm. by invading um, Estonia and Latvia, both uh, NATO member countries, um, and threaten the West with nuclear weapons um, in response to any kind of NATO Western retaliation um, against Russia. And also now the prospect that China could be resupplying uh, Russian armed forces with, uh, with military equipment um, puts this conflict now into a very dangerous situation yep. whereby not only would we be at war with Russia but essentially would also be at war with China and also the fact that the Iranians are now uh, developing nuclear weapons and um, increasing their centrifuge to 80% from 60 so they are very close to nuclear breakout. We, we could also face in the prospect of war against Iran as well uh, which could uh, and which is an access of evil, uh, you know, we could be facing the prospect of, of World War III. Well, very definitely, we see various conflict hotspots around the world at the moment. I remember a few years ago, a, f a friend of mine and um, s someone quite um, uh, analytical uh, in the political sphere believed that the point of tension for World War III would come primarily in uh, the India-Pakistan region. Um, but Russia-Ukraine um, was also sort of a, a potential in his viewpoint. And what, what you're seeing here is a, 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 real, um, a, a real sense in which other nations getting involved increasingly, those nations then act in particular ways. Alliances are being built, we're, we're entering a uh, phase that could be very much um, reflective of some of the similar happenings around World War I. Uh, wherein so many alliances between different parties have been made uh, that there is no choice but to back those parties. Belarus has already indicated it's going to be backing Russia should there be any further escalation and um, so, so it will be involved. It's already been involved to a degree. We also have you know, um, Chechnyan involvement that's been there from day one essentially. Uh, but China entering uh, that, that throws things into a whole new sphere and what we could see linked in with that is China not only rearming Russia but perhaps um, uh, taking you know some, some mutual support to some way to launch its own offensive um, into Taiwan which is what it's it, it's been gearing up for and we've talked a little bit about that before on the program as well. We're now going to take a clip at one of those growing alliances, of a news report from our good friends at CBN, which details President Biden's visit to Ukraine. Biden arrived at Ukraine's Marlinsky Palace to announce an additional half billion dollars in U.S. assistance and pledged continued American support. One year later, Kyiv stands and Ukraine stands. Democracy stands, the Americans stand with you, and the world stands with you. While Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been an unmitigated military disaster, with as many as 180,000 casualties, Ukraine warns that it is running out of both men and materiel as Russia begins another offensive.
Now, some U.S. officials want the administration to train Ukrainians to fly F-16 fighters so it can send the warplanes to help in the fight against Russia. United States U.N. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield sounding as if it was not a matter of if the U.S. sends the jets, but how. We have to ensure, and I think Secretary Blinken said this as well, that they have the training necessary and the capacity to use weapon systems that we provide to them. The chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee told CNN he hopes the U.S. sends the fighter jets. But the fact is, uh, the longer they wait, the longer this, this uh, conflict will prevail. We need to throw everything we can into this fight. Uh, so that they can win. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Blinken warns that China is considering sending weapons to Russia and warned Chinese Foreign Affairs official Wang Yi in Munich this weekend that such a move would have grave consequences. It was important for me to share very clearly with, with Wang Yi uh, that this would be a serious problem. The White House has accused Russia of crimes against humanity in its war against Ukraine. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham says the U.S. should go further and designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Because if you do that under U.S. law and China provides lethal weapons, they will get sanctioned. And to the Chinese, if you jump on the Putin train now, you're dumber than dirt. It would be like buying a ticket on the Titanic after you saw the movie. Don't do this. Joe Biden's next stop is Poland, where he'll meet with President Duda and deliver a speech calling on Europe and the world to continue standing with Ukraine for as long as it takes to defeat the Russians. Dale Hurd, CBN. Great report there as ever by Dale Hurd from CBN. And um, yeah, and uh, well done for President uh, Joe Biden for uh, visiting uh, Kyiv and showing solidarity with uh, President Zelensky mm. and his wife and the Ukrainian people. Um, my fear is that this is becoming a slightly part political partisan issue in the states where there's real division between the Democrats and the Republicans. And because the Democrats are supporting this war, then the, the Republicans want to distance themselves from this war. But you can really see that policy uh, of uh, isolationism uh, that dominated US foreign policy in the 1920s and 30s creeping in, into US politics. It didn't work then and it won't work now. There's no way out of it. They have certain promises that have been made uh, previously, uh, certain agreements that have been made in, in regard to making sure that Ukraine is protected, in regard to making sure that um, it does not come under sustained assault and threat from Russia, and um, it, it's being forced to uh, commit both funds and uh, military hardware uh, to support Ukraine at some point, should there be such an escalation that sees China enter the fray, uh, there may very well be a boots on the ground scenario. We're not there yet. Uh, they're trying to keep things at uh, sort of a, a plateau level rather than escalation. It's almost impossible to de-escalate. De-escalation uh, takes two parties and uh, Ukraine is not willing to give up territory. Understandably and rightly so. They uh, and they want the Donbass and the Crimea back as well. They do. Uh, they will only be happy if they get 100% of their territory back and have that territorial integrity yeah. whilst Putin it considered himself now particularly since his third term as uh, president of Russia has uh, reinvented himself as a Russian uh, war leader or a Rus uh, as a um, as a you know early uh, Russian emperor emperor you name it he, he's definitely on a war footing uh, and wants to be seen as a, a wartime president so he's not going to back down either unless things get so bad for him that he's got no other choice. So let's also remind her, uh, so on Friday, it will be the 24th anniversary. Uh, sorry, it'll be, uh, sorry, on Friday, the 24th of February, it'll be the first anniversary of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Um, we also see that uh, this is the biggest war invasion that Europe has witnessed since the Second World War. And according to the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, known as CSIS, the initial Russian invasion force numbered 190,000 troops. Uh, that included militias in the Donbass region and special forces. 
Ground combat troops are believed to be in the region of 140,000. Uh, statistics from the Office of the United Nations High Command for Human Rights verified a total of 7,199 uh, civilian deaths during Russia's invasion of the Ukraine as of February the 12th, uh, 2023. Of, of them, 438 were children. Uh, furthermore, 11,756 people were reported to have been injured. However, the OHCHR specified that the real number could be much higher. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has created the biggest refugee crisis that Europe has seen since the Second World War. Uh, here are some of the figures. The OHCHR has estimated the number of deaths of civilians or non-armed individuals in Ukraine is at over 7.1 thousand since the start of the war on February 24th of 2022. The highest death toll was recorded in March of 2022 at over 3.2 thousand. The figures on soldier deaths are reported by Russia and Ukraine's governmental authorities, but they cannot be verified at this point and thus need to be taken with caution. Around 8.1 million people have been displaced from Ukraine into Europe, according to data assembled by the UNHCR, corresponding to around 19% of the total Ukrainian population, with roughly 18.6 million people left in Ukraine, while 10.3 million have since returned to the country. Uh, which is quite extraordinary when we actually break down the statistics uh, of this war, including the number of civilians who have killed, how many uh, <coughs> Russian troops actually invaded the Ukraine. Uh, and now that we're seeing, we need to talk about the kind of NATO response. So NATO is known as the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, is a defensive military alliance that was formed in 1949 by 12 countries, including the US, the UK, Canada and France. Members agreed to help one another if they came under attack. The organization's uh, original goal was to challenge Russian expansion in Europe after the Second World War, after the Soviet collapse in 1991 and many of the Eastern European countries, which used to be Russia's allies uh, in the Warsaw Pact group, were then granted NATO membership. However, since Russia's invasion, NATO um, countries have stationed 40,000 troops in Eastern Europe on the territory of alliance members such as Lithuania and Poland. They have also have another 300,000 troops on high alert in Europe. And NATO at the start of the invasion was concerned that once uh, Ukraine was occupied, Russia could then invade the former Soviet republics uh, in Eastern Europe and uh, that uh, Putin wouldn't be content uh, just uh, staying uh, at Kyiv. They've condemned in the strongest possible terms Russia's brutal and unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, which has up to this point been an independent, peaceful and democratic country. A very close NATO ally, though, though not formally a member, that has been something that has since been discussed and pushed for. NATO and allies continue to provide Ukraine with unprecedented levels of support, helping to uphold its fundamental right to self-defense. And I, I want to reiterate that this is their fundamental right. They are sovereign over their territory and over their borders. They've existed as an independent country for some time now. They um, th themselves um, have elected their president in honest, fair elections. Ukraine has probably the same levels of corruption as any other uh, Western country. You know, people will, will highlight that probably about the same in Russia as well. So uh, those discussions that I know people have uh, trying to rationalize or legitimize or um, act as if Russia might have had some legitimate interest in Ukraine, it just doesn't hold much water. Every nation will have its problems and its fair share of uh, issues in, in r relation to corruption. That doesn't mean that it's acceptable to desecrate the country's fundamental right to self-determination. There's no justification for an invasion of uh, an independent sovereign state, uh, particularly in the 21st century. Um, so let's look, break down at the cost of this war um, as we mark the first anniversary of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. So in total, according to the US government, they have approved $50 billion in aid for Ukraine in 2022. Uh, half of that money, or 24.9 billion US dollars, 
went towards military spending. By comparison, US military aid to Israel, a a long-term top recipient of uh, US military aid in 2020, was $3.8 million. Uh, The US also gave $9.6 billion to Ukraine for uh, non-military purposes in 2022, such as helping the Ukrainians receive medical care and food. Uh, This marked a sharp increase from the $343 million total in foreign aid the US gave Ukraine in 2021. Uh, This includes both military and economic assistance. And according to the British government's own website, uh, we are the second largest contributor in military aid to Ukraine, committing in a region of 2.3 billion um, in 2022, that could have gone up to about 2.6 billion. So um, let's remind ourselves of the horrific events that occurred this coming Friday on the 24th of February 2022, when 140 or 160,000 Russian troops invaded the Ukraine. War sirens wailing in Kyiv before dawn, followed by early morning explosions in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. Explosions reported near Kyiv and other cities across Ukraine as Russia targeted key infrastructure, military air bases and air defense systems. The bombing sent Ukrainians scrambling for safety. These scenes were from the port city of Mariupol, people lining up at ATMs and packing up their cars. In Kyiv, the capital, traffic backing up as far as the eye can see. Overnight, President Putin announced the beginning of Russian military operations in Ukraine, disguising his full-scale invasion as a mission to support Russian rebels in the Donbass region of Luhansk and Donetsk, land he claims belongs to Russia. Now a doorway for Russian troops into Ukrainian territory. It won't be bloodless. Uh, There will be suffering. There will be sacrifice. Ukraine's foreign ministry says they've landed in the southern port of Odessa, crossing into Kharkiv. This security footage shows Russian military crossing into Ukraine from Crimea, the peninsula seized by Russia in 2014. Ukrainian forces are fighting back in Donbass, as well as regions in the north and south. Dozens of soldiers reported dead so far, as well as civilian casualties. President Zelensky calling on Ukrainians to rise up and fight the invaders in the cities and town squares, encouraging citizens to take up arms. The country's UN ambassador delivering this message to Russia at last night's Security Council meeting. There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell. Ambassador. Meanwhile, the world community is responding with promise of sanctions, but no military aid. We are banding together in strong terms to condemn these outrageous acts in the strongest possible terms. President Biden issuing a statement last night saying, quote, Russia alone is responsible for the death and destruction this attack will bring, and the United States and its allies and partners will respond in a united and decisive way. The world will hold Russia accountable. The president is expected to address the nation at noon today and announce crippling economic sanctions against Russia. The White House has been very clear it will not send troops into Ukraine, even to rescue Americans. However, U.S. troops are on the border with Poland and ready to help those fleeing from Ukraine. Uh, We are now joined by uh, Major Retired Rhett Parkinson, who is the director of the Armed Forces Christian Union, Um, a a good friend of mine and always an absolute pleasure to interview. Um, Rhett, uh, warm welcome to Behind Headlines. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Pleasure as always. Uh, And and Rhett, what is your uh, perspective on the uh, war in the Ukraine as we mark the first anniversary of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. And just give us a little bit of a a perspective from your military experience and know-how. Well, who'd have thought uh, here in the 21st century, you know, a little over a year ago, that we would be facing a major conflict in Europe once again. Uh, And it's really significant. The scale is uh, quite overwhelming. Even the current uh, front line is nearly 1,000 kilometres long uh, between the the Russians and the Ukrainians. Uh, And something in the the order of 2,000 plus tanks have uh, reportedly been destroyed. But that shows the scale of the conflict that we've seen. 
Um, the casualty figures are horrific, almost sort of First World War uh, scales. Um, and here we are, you know, looking at a major arm, armoured uh, conflict uh, in in Europe, uh, which has played itself out over the last 12 months. Right. Have you been surprised by the Ukraine's military force and its effectiveness against what was initially put forward as a far superior Russian army? Yes and no. I think, um, you know, it's clear the Ukrainians are fighting for their survival, fighting for their country, fighting um, ultimately for, for, for uh, democracy and freedom. Um, Putin has clearly underestimated them and I think somewhat sort of perhaps naively expected to just roll up, roll through the borders and, and up to Kiev, uh, up to Kiev and, and take over the whole country. Uh, in a in a relatively unopposed way, uh, I did hear or speak to somebody who who chatted to the Ukrainians. Uh, you know, all the intelligence a year ago was the Russians were going to invade, and the Ukrainians were initially caught by surprise. And the Ukrainian officer said, uh, "Well, of course, you know, we worked out, particularly after the invasion of, of Crimea and the fighting in the Donbas since 2014." how to counter the Russian threat. Um, and we'd worked out that we would stop them before they got to Kyiv. Uh, unfortunately, nobody passed that information to Putin and all the, the people are, uh, in his immediate circle appear to have agreed with him that this would be a swift campaign. Uh, and Rhett, according to our own um, government sources, uh, namely our government website, uh, we are the second largest military donors to uh, Ukraine. Uh, we've given in the region of the region between 2.3 and 2.6 billion pounds in terms of military equipment and hardware. Um, <clears throat> what is the strategic thinking behind the government's decision um, to back the Ukrainians in their war against the Russians? Well, I can't speak for Rishi Sunak or his predecessors, but I think it's clear that what is happening is effectively a clash of ideologies between a liberal democracy, which is what we hold uh, dear in the West and what the Ukrainians are clearly holding dear, uh, and uh, uh, at best uh, an autocracy or, if you like, a dictatorship, which Putin represents um, with, alongside the Russians. And so I think we, we, we feel that this is a battle that is being fought on our behalf. And tragically, a lot of Ukrainians are being injured and killed um, but effectively, they are fighting with uh, we the West's weapons. Uh, and without them, they, there is no doubt that they would have been rolled over uh, or, or suffered significantly more casualties and probably lost a lot more terrain without the, the significant backing of the West. Uh, and we are part of that. And I uh, can't really comment on the, the political sort of machinations as to why uh, we are so heavily involved. But I think it's clear that the Ukrainians are fighting for democracy, and that's why the West is backing them. How do you think Russia can survive this war? Is it believed they've lost in the region of 200,000 men in the conflict, and their weapons are no match for the Western military technology that's being supplied, and uh, they're increasingly just showing they seem to have no morale? I think there was a quote early in the, uh, uh, the build-up before the actual conflict started, and I think if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, it was attributed to the foreign minister of Russia, who said something like, um, we Russians know how to suffer. And when you think that, um, you know, in the Second World War, they suffered an estimated 20 million casualties uh, from a population which was a lot less than what it is currently. Currently, it's somewhere between 145, 150 million uh, Russians. Actually, 200,000 for them is not that many. Um, mm. Is this a war of national survival for Russia? No, not really. Um, it's a war of choice by, by Putin. Um, but his credibility and his survival and all of those in, in power, including the, the senior military commanders, are at stake. And so I think they will continue to, to fight until such point as um, they, they can't fight anymore. So I think, sadly, it's got a long way to run yet.
Uh, uh, Rhett, uh, what are your thoughts on what a, uh, quite a few American military analysts are actually suggesting that um, <coughs> Putin may decide to invade uh, Latvia and Estonia as a kind of diversionary tactics, as a kind of uh, land grab there, a short uh, invasion, take over the territory where the majority of those living in those countries are kind of the Russian population, um, and then threaten uh, the West with, with nuclear weapons to try and save face after his uh, devastation that he's facing uh, in the Ukraine by, uh, by our weapons? Personally, I think it's fairly unlikely. I mean, who knows what's going through Putin's mind and what his uh, advisors are, are telling him. Um, but to take on or to invade a NATO country would uh, invoke Article 5, um, and that would bring uh, the full might of the West, which, frankly, we haven't really seen, particularly the air power, uh, which, um, you know, the Russians have been woefully inadequate in many ways. But by the time you bring in the American just sheer scale, uh, uh, as well as their, their, their high end technology, I think that would 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 change things. I understand that Putin's had a fairly robust conversation, sorry, uh, Biden has with Putin and said, if you use any kind of nuclear weapons, then uh, not only the forces that fired them, but uh, your you know, Baltic Sea Fleet and various other, um, uh, the Black Sea Fleet are toast. They will be utterly destroyed. Uh, that is a game changer. And if you cross that line, then there will be very serious consequences. And I think that that message is is quite clear from NATO, uh, and I think Putin would be quite literally mad to take that option. There are some rumblings that China could help rearm Russia. Could this be the light that starts World War Three? Well, a million dollar question. I think if it's just um, armaments, no. I mean, we are pouring our armaments into into Ukraine. Um, Russia must be running short um, with a limited ability to um, manufacture sophisticated arms, certainly. Um, and so they're going to be scouting around to find some sources um, to bolster their uh, ammunition supply in particular. Um, if the Chinese provide it, my personal opinion, I don't think it's likely that that will that will be the the red line that that brings you know that we crossed to to instigate World War Three. Um, but I, you know, we clearly live in dangerous times, and, and it is um, unsettling to see what is happening across the world. Uh, and Rhett, just two very uh, quick questions within a minute. Uh, the first is: Are you concerned that we are spending so much in supporting the Ukrainians? Uh, with military hardware, that this is leaving our own military short. And many British generals are complaining to the British government that we can no longer defend ourselves. And also, how can our viewers get behind the excellent work that you are doing at the Armed Forces Christian Union in supporting Christians who are part of our armed forces, the Army, the Royal uh, Navy, and of course, the Royal Air Force? Well, I think um, it's difficult for me to 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 comment on on the first part of that question. The generals have the information; uh, they're competing for finite resource, along with um, not just the army, with the air force and the navy, but but with the NHS, with uh, all the benefits and all the other government departments. Um, so, I think that has to be seen in that light. In terms of how to pray, clearly there's a lot of suffering. I think we need to pray for Putin and uh, for Zelensky. Uh, for all those who have lost loved ones uh, in the conflict, both Russian and Ukrainian, uh, those who are injured and affected by it, and those indirectly affected. So we have a lot of our members, uh, some of my friends are uh, in Eastern Europe at the moment. Uh, they live with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, they are there just in case Putin does something crazy. But yeah, prayers for them would be very much appreciated. And you can get in touch via the website if you want to be more involved. Major Rhett Parkinson, thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Behind the Headlines. And uh, for those viewers who want to uh, check out the important work that is being done with Christians in the Armed Forces, please visit www.afcu.org.uk. As always, good to have uh, retired Major Rhett Parkinson, the Director of the Armed Forces Christian Union, on uh, Behind the Headlines to give a kind of military perspective
on this conflict. And, and I, I, I'm of the opinion that I, if the West didn't resupply Ukraine with weapons and arms, then I think uh, you know Putin could have invaded you know Estonia, um, Latvia, the, the Baltic states. He could have even invaded Poland, despite the fact that these nations are uh, members of, of NATO. Um, and uh, we could face a situation where th this could actually escalate. And if if we're going to learn anything from history, it's that you never appease dictators. Mm. And for them, you c they, enough territory is never enough because they want domination, particularly with, uh, uh, with President Putin considering himself as now a wartime president um, who wants to go down in history to be compared with the likes of Stalin, for example, the uh, leader of the Soviet Union, um, and the way that he was able to push back that uh, Russian, uh, sorry, the uh, Nazi advance during the Second World War. And of course, you had the battles over Stalingrad and Leningrad. And, and of course, these became stories in which uh, become folklore in, in, in Russia and uh, particularly as they mark the uh, 6th of May is their biggest holiday um, where they mark the defeat of the Nazi forces uh, and the mark the end of the Second World War in Europe. Mm. Uh, you know you're exactly right to highlight that Simon uh, this is the comparison that Putin himself is drawing uh, routinely is speaking about Nazis in Europe. He, uh, when, when he spoke about German tanks coming in to, um, the Germans have pledged extra backup, extra military hardware, and so he uh, says now, you know, we're facing German tanks once again. Uh, and so he's trying to stir up that general feeling of patriotism um, against the Germans and is, is painting this as a campaign of denazification. Yeah, absolutely. But it's also important to, to make um, our, our viewers aware in particular that, you know, 20,000 Russians protesting the war in mm. the Ukraine have been taken to determined camps uh, where they face the prospect of uh, 15 years in, uh, in so-called prisons, a bit like the old uh, Soviet gulags. Um, we also see that you could face a nine year prison sentence for even mentioning the word war in Russia instead of a special military operation. And those soldiers who are complaining about how the war is going also could be facing then nine years in prison. So, you know, let, let's understand that in Russia today, there is no democracy, there is no freedom of speech, and that effectively Putin has put around him a uh, totalitarian regime that, uh, that mirror reflects that of the time of, uh, of Stalin. They're in many ways using what are in effect like suicide squads to carry out their, their missions wherein they're going into the prisons and they're saying, okay, we will cut your time, uh, we'll, we'll set you free if you um, a fight for the Wagner Group, for instance. I came across a, a story recently of a student who had, uh, rightly or wrongly, it's unclear what had happened, but um, he had been detained on uh, possession of drugs charges. He uh, was an international student from Zambia, uh, was a part of a church actually um, that I'm, I know of there, um, was put in prison um, for these um, drugs charges, rightly or wrongly, is then um, given the opportunity to have freedom, um, placed, unclear how, uh, whether voluntarily uh, as, as a way out to hopefully desert or whether um, forced in the Wagner group. And um, it was as, as part of that that he, um, uh, he was killed in, in conflict. And um, whether it was, it's unclear whether he was shot and trying to desert or whether um, it was in conflict um, in a battle with Ukrainian soldiers, but this is this is part of what's going on. Uh, but it shouldn't come as any surprise. R Russian forces have been committing war crimes. Uh, we can look at Bucha. We had a man who, I, I remind you, just about uh, a little uh, less than a year ago, a man from Bucha who leads yeah, April. A, we record that yeah, in April, uh, a theological um, a college. Uh, professor and I believe the president of, of this particular seminary, a pastor as well, came on the program, told us his first-hand experience of going back to Bucha after uh, the Russians had, had finally been pushed back, discovering the remains of his apartment, 
and uh, Russian soldiers' coats and um, various other things laying about um, in um, his living room, uh, which had been looted. Uh, you know, we, we have a Ukrainian city here wherein so many uh, thousands of people are estimated to have been slaughtered. Um, it's a Ukrainian city in Kiev's oblast area, and before the war its population was 36,971. The battle lasted from February 27th to 31st of March uh, 2022, and according to the Daily Telegraph, Olabucha is a crime scene as investigators unearth mass graves and mutilated corpses one after the other. War investigators have a massive task on their hands as over 1,200 citizens have been murdered in towns around Kiev, um, if, even if no more mass graves are uncovered in Ukraine. The massacre at Bucha would be the worst in Europe since Srebrenica in uh, 1995 when 8,000 Bosnian men and boys were killed by Serbs, uh, which happened under the watch of the United Nations who declared the town a safe area. Some 6,800 victims were later identified through DNA analysis of body parts and their deaths were prosecuted as murder. So I think we could be headed to a similar situation uh, in uh, relation to Bucha. So let's have a look and uh, remind ourselves of the uh, crimes against humanity committed by uh, Russian troops in uh, Bucha in the Ukraine as uh, the uh, uh, investigators discovered mass, mass graves. So let's have a look and watch this CBN report and uh, warn you that uh, uh, this is distressing and disturbing. This is one of the main roads leading to Bucha, a city on the outskirts of Kyiv. Along this highway, burned out Russian tanks serve as a reminder of Moscow's failed attempts to capture the capital. I can count at least at least eight Russian tanks. And these are the tanks that were, in essence, guarding the road to Bucha. And it's really remarkable that since Russia's invasion on February 24th, that today the two cities of Bucha and Erpin are completely free and are in control of the Ukrainians. At one point, this spot became a popular gathering place for people taking pictures and walking amidst the charred remains. The Russians should take these tanks and parade them in Moscow. The fact that we forced them out of Bucha is God's miracle. This is God's miracle and nothing else. Despite the victory, the horrors of what happened in Bucha continue to haunt the nation. 15 miles west of Kyiv, Forensic experts recently exhumed the bodies of seven civilians found buried here in the forest. Investigators say one of the bodies had been decapitated. Shots to the knees tell us the people were tortured. The hands tied behind the back with tape says the people had been held hostage for a long time, and they tried to get any information from them. Russian forces withdrew from Bucha on March 31st. Four months later, Ukrainian authorities are still finding bodies. So far, we have not identified approximately 213 bodies of the dead. This is an operating figure. We identify bodies every day. Sometimes new bodies appear. A European human rights delegation visiting Bucha late last month called the scene a theater of cold-blooded murder of civilians on a massive scale. Now international investigators are gathering evidence to determine whether war crimes were committed. We talk not only about those who committed the crime, the direct crime, on the spot and in location. They, of course, have responsibility. But we're also talking about those who are in the chain of command. If necessary, right to the very top. Oleg Bondarenko knows how fortunate he is to be alive. A few days after war started, Russian soldiers captured this pastor along with several other civilians and tortured them behind this gate for days. I was so nervous that they would find something compromising about me. The Russian battalion commander did not like me. He was always angry with me. Bondarenko told CBN News that the Russians wanted information on Ukrainian military positions in the area. The commander said he would make me watch as he killed the others, and then he would skin me alive. Ukrainian soldiers launched a counteroffensive and managed to rescue Bondarenko.
The Russians didn't even have time to come and say goodbye to us. There were lots of our soldiers and the battle was intense. Not far from Bodarenko, Sergei Anohin and 167 Ukrainian Christians hid in the basement of this Bucha church when the Russian assault started. Four Russian soldiers came into the basement. The rest were standing over there. There were 15 of them. When they entered the church, they kicked open the church door and cursed at us. Remaining at the church for several days, the soldiers constantly intimidated those hiding in the basement. Video and pictures obtained by CBN News show church members praying, singing and reading scriptures day and night. We now know that during this time, while we sought refuge in the basement, people around us, many of them, were being killed by the Russians. Many of them were being tortured. Anohin believes God spared their lives because of their prayers. It was very clear to us that God was watching over us. Everything was in his hands. Like the story of how Daniel was in the lion's den, we were under God's protection. Days after Russian troops withdrew from Bucha after failing to capture the capital, Ukraine's security agency met with Anohin about a Russian commander who had been at the church. One of the Russian soldiers, his nickname was Skipper, he would come and talk to us in the basement every day. We thought he was a kind soldier. But the Ukrainian security service later told us that he was one of the most cruelest soldiers and apparently ordered multiple killings and was responsible for torturing people in basements around Bucha. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. In April, Russia's President Vladimir Putin honored the brigade that laid siege to Bucha, calling their acts mass heroism and bravery. Ukraine has accused the brigade of committing war crimes. I would like for people to pray for our city, that God would give peace in people's hearts. There's a lot of anger and hatred for what the Russians did to us, but I'm praying God will touch us and give us peace. Anohin, whose home was destroyed on the second day of war, says residents of Bucha are slowly returning, trying to get back to normal. Still, the trauma from the war lingers, and the healing is only beginning. I would like our city to be remembered for those who were loyal, those who protected the city, and those who were faithful to God. George Thomas, CBN News, Bucha, Ukraine. Tragic scenes that to reflect on and remember from just a little bit less than a year ago in Bucha. Um, doubtless, Simon, crimes against humanity. Uh, this isn't just uh, a normal feature of war. These are civilians who have been massacred and there must be justice. Absolutely. And also, I think as Christians, we can't be complacent in the face of evil. And what the uh, Russian troops have committed um, is evil. It's genocide. Uh, you know, we, we singled out the Nazis for their behavior, but the Russians have behaved in exactly the same manner as well. Yeah. Um, and there is no excuse for that whatsoever. And so therefore should face international law and uh, should go up against the uh, criminal court in The Hague. Um, but also, sadly, uh, we see in this situation, we want to now look at how Russia is losing in this war. I just read an article a few days ago from the Daily Mail that was published on the 17th of February 2023. It says that Vladimir Putin has suffered a double blow to his war effort in the Ukraine, losing a military intelligence uh, colonel and a decorated paratroop in the matter of days as Britain estimates that Russia has suffered as many as 200,000 casualties. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Viktor uh, Forsov, uh, 37, was killed on a combat mission, although the exact circumstances of his death haven't been disclosed. Ukraine and its Western allies say that Putin is sacrificing unprecedented numbers of Russia's soldiers in a war to illegally invade in the sovereign state of Ukraine, with uh, some reports saying that 800 Russians a day are being killed, more than 800 
Russians today are being killed on the battlefield. There are accusations that Putin is using mobilized troops as cannon fodder in First World War style tactics across the Eastern front line. Indeed, life seems to be cheap in his view. It does appear that he's just throwing whatever he can, um, hoping in some way that they can uh, break through. Estimates vary on the Russian toll in the war, but are now likely to exceed 100,000, with Ukraine saying more than 140,000 have been killed since February. February of 2022. An intelligence update on Friday saw Britain's Ministry of Defense say that Russian forces, including private military contractor Wagner, have likely suffered between 175 to 200,000 casualties since the start of Putin's invasion. It likely includes uh, approximately 40 to 60,000 killed, with the Russian casualty rate significantly increasing since September of 2022 when partial mobilization was imposed. And, and that featured um, also many Russian men abandoning the country and, and seeking to flee elsewhere to avoid that mobilization. Um, they simply don't believe in this war in many cases. The uh, MOD said the ratio of Russians killed to those injured was high by modern standards, suggesting wounded soldiers were receiving poor medical treatment. What's Putin's response been to this? Well, at a moment when um, Putin is giving serious consideration to a new spring offensive to make up for the disastrous losses that he suffered last year, um, he may very well decide to launch a surprise smash and grab invasion of Latvia and Estonia, threatening the West with nuclear war as his way out um, to save face essentially at home. In his third term as president, he has recast himself now as Russia's wartime uh, president. And also we've got to be uh, concerned now with the prospect of uh, China getting involved. Uh, and this is why we could see that uh, uh, former prime ministers such as uh, Boris Johnson uh, and uh, together with, uh, with our former prime minister as well, um, have actually been arguing that we should be supplying the Ukraine with tanks and greater weapons to finish this war. Uh, because then we know that if this war continues and the Chinese then get involved and sup start supplying military weapons and hardware, where to, to Putin, this will strengthen a Putin's uh, military response against the Ukrainians. And then, yeah, we're back to where we started from a year ago uh, with the prospect then of a, a threat to NATO. And if one NATO-like uh, nation such as Latvia or, or, or one of those other um, uh, states in, in, the, in the Baltic states um, are invaded, then this would escalate into a full-scale war again with NATO uh, and then before we know it we, we're just being sucked into uh, World War III so the situation is extremely precarious it's very very dangerous it's war so everything is fast moving and uh, we just really need to kind of pray and intercede and uh, because the yeah, this is, this is a very dangerous situation, that's for sure, as we mark the first anniversary of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Well, Moldova is a particular one to watch. The relations that Russia has with Moldova are already tense. Moldova itself is quite a weak nation, with many uh, native Moldovans choosing to leave. They've harbored Ukrainians as well. So Moldova may very well be um, a crisis point to um, keep eyes on also. Um, Zelensky has made a warning concerning World War III and it will be interesting to see how the U.S. and other NATO nations respond in the light of this. Uh, we've not come so close to nuclear confrontation since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 and if China does decide to resupply Russian military equipment then it could well trigger World War III and the West would be against Russia, China and Iran. Uh, Reagan, it's great to be doing this program, particularly as we mark the uh, first anniversary of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine that takes place this Friday, which is the 24th of February. Uh, thank you, viewers, for tuning in and uh, also for your engagement on this topic over the past almost two years since we began discussing the potential for this, but one year uh, since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Remember our brothers and sisters in Ukraine in prayer. They remain active and fervent in ministry in very trying, very tough times. Ask for God's deliverance. Ask for peace. 
And may the God of peace um, be with us all. Uh, bless you. We'll see you next time on Behind the Headlines.